I want to talk to you today a little bit about MX3D, how we've got into the world of uh, 3D printing of robotics and uh, ending up uh, becoming a tech startup. Uh, we started as a design office. First, I want to introduce you to this guy. Apologies for the very bad quality of the photo, but I couldn't find a better one. This is uh, Nikolai Suchajin, Russian uh, entrepreneur. Some websites say he's a crime lord, criminal, but I, I don't know because I don't know the guy. I only know what he did, and it's actually quite cool. This guy, he um, wants to build a house, his own house. So he, he applied for a permit for a two-story building. So he built his house, then he looked at the neighbor's house, which was three stories, and he thought, hmm, I need a bigger house. So he added levels on top of his house. And then he had a four-story building, and he thought it looked a little bit weird, so he kept on adding stories, levels to his house, um, ending up with this house. This is actually a 45 meter high uh, wooden cabin. It's the, high, the, the, the tallest wooden cabin in the world, built by a single guy. And what I think what's cool about this is that I see a lot of parallels between how this guy works, what he does, and what we are doing. And, and one of those parallels is the fact that when he started building this house, he didn't know that he was going to end up with the tallest wooden building in the, in the world, 45 meters high. But, you know, he, he did it anyway. And, uh, and, and later on, I'll, I'll tell you another parallel with, with the project that we're doing. So first, I'd like to explain what, what we are doing. We started out as a furniture design and manufacturing company, making a lot of uh, different fur furniture, uh, very experimental. We work with new materials, new technology, and we already quite soon, quite early got in the world of 3D printing with it. So sometimes these uh, projects, they, they, they end up in nothing, and sometimes they end up in very exclusive furniture that we sell to our gallery in uh, New York. And um, one of the projects, I, uh, I want to explain basically two projects. One is the one you see here, uh, um, that's a table. It's a table we made, aluminium, CNC machined. But the downside of aluminium is that it's very scratch sensitive. So we wanted to add a very hard layer on top of it. And this actually it looks like a lightsaber cutting through a table, but this is actually uh, a robot spraying on tungsten carbide powder. And tungsten carbide is a very, very hard material. It's almost as hard as a diamond. But you can imagine it's quite hard to finish a material like this. It takes, takes a long time to, uh, to grind it down. Another project I <coughs> like to talk about is the bone chair. This is done about 11 years ago, and back then, that was really the beginning of topology optimization software. Right now, uh, a lot of companies, such as Autodesk, for instance, they have a topology optimization plugin uh, worked in their software. But back then, you had to wait, we had to wait for a week for uh, an iteration of uh, this chair. And the idea, it's clear, you know, you put, you put forces on the chair that you might expect on the chair, and then the computer starts taking material away up until the point that the chair fails. But you end up with a rendering, and you can't sell a rendering, so we had to produce it. And and this is actually what's, what's a little bit what Andreas was talking about as well. The, it was too expensive to print it in metal. And I think back then, there weren't even that many metal printers around. So what we did was, instead, we printed the mold in, in parts, in a sand material, and we cast it aluminium in it. And in that way, we could make a very, very complex shape uh, work. So <coughs> three printing, I think there's, there's two... Um, uh, categories. One is the home printer, you know, the one you use, you use at home, the, the Ultimaker, which the current status is a little bit the same as the dot matrix printer in the, in the, in the 80s. Um, and on the other side, you have the very professional machines. So first project we did was with this machine. It's small. It's only one material. It's, uh, the material is, is it's plastic. It's not really a nice material. But we thought, let's see if we can make it, we can use it um, to our advantage. To our advantage. So we took the shape of a chair, which is obviously way too big to print in a, uh, in a building volume of a machine like this, and we broke it down into uh, jigsaw puzzle parts. And everybody who has a printer at home can download this uh, chair. It's free, available online, and you can print the pieces and then actually um, um, put it together. You do need a little bit of patience because it takes quite long to print this on a printer like this. It's like three, three hours per piece, and it's a lot of pieces. But the cool thing is you can customize it, you can change the color, so you're kind of you know, um, democratizing the, the production method. And um, 
So this is my daughter with a children's version of the chair. You can see she's quite happy with it. So the other side of the spectrum is the, the really professional machines. What Andreas already told, you know, they're, they're very expensive machines. They are very cool. This is a chair we made with it. You can print very intricate shapes, high level of detail, uh, high level of accuracy. The only downside is, one of the only downsides is the price, the cost. It's, it's a very, very expensive machine. I think a machine like this will cost you probably uh, at least half a million euros. Another downside of it, which is actually more problematic for us, is building volume. So a machine like this, um, the chair that we made, we had to cut it up into 16 different pieces in order to fit in six building volumes uh, of the printer, which is, uh, which is of course crazy. So <clears throat> we thought there's room for development, uh, for improvement. And we went to uh, several 3D printing companies and asked them, can you please make us a printer that can print a full-size chair? Uh, but nobody was interested. I don't know why, but uh, nobody uh, wanted to help us. So we took matters into our own hands. We, we bought an old industrial robot from the car industry, and together with two students from a university in Barcelona, we started developing this printer. And it's using a very fast curing resin, two components, which mixes all the way in the tip of the machine, and, uh, and, and by that it's printing. And the cool thing about using a robot for printing is that rather than three axes, so you, you, and printing inside a building volume, you, can, you, can, you have six axes, so you can move outside of the building volume. And we call it printing outside the box. So you can print you know, structures starting from the wall, and, and you're almost unlimited in size, because um, if you go out of reach, you just move the robot and you can keep on printing. Downside of this material uh, te technique was the material. It doesn't really look nice. It's a very brittle, lightweight material, so for, for um, furniture design, it doesn't really do anything. So we thought maybe we can repeat that trick with metal. And we bought a MIG welding machine. And MIG welding is a technique where you melt metal um, and you constantly add new material to it. So if you keep on doing that, you're basically printing. And we started experimenting with it. And we re re it was kind of like an eureka moment for us. We, we were already dreaming about uh, early retirement. Brilliant idea. Be rich. But unfortunately, um, Mr. Ralph Baker had exactly the same idea about 100 years before us. This is a patent from 1920, which uh, describes the um, making decorative uh, objects with a welding technique. But luckily, Mr. Baker didn't have robots and um, computers. So there was a, still a lot for us to develop. So we started testing, you know, printing straight lines, using the six axes of the robot, printing curved lines. Uh, making network structures, you know, it, it, uh, not everything went very well. You can see that a lot of stuff went wrong. We had to learn how the machine worked, how it's, how it's moving, the welding process we need to get under control. This actually happened many times, but I think we burned about five brooms in our uh, workshop trying to keep the space uh, clean. But we got better at it, and at a certain point we felt confident enough to, to, to print something we could actually use and, and sell. So this is a dragon bench. We've printed about seven of those. It's, a, it's an artwork for Joris Laman as well. And the cool thing about the seven dragon benches that we've printed is all of them are different. Because you know everybody understands the cool thing about additive manufacturing is you don't need molds anymore. So you can everything can be unique. And <clears throat> So we posted a video online and um, that caught the attention of, uh, of Autodesk. And they visited us, uh, Jeff Kowalski uh, visited us and uh, wanted to collaborate with us. And so, you know, we were cramped away in a small space. We got a little bit of budget so we could move to a bigger space. And, um, uh, and, and going to a bigger space, you also get bigger ideas. So we started thinking, what, can we, what else can we use this technique for? And we started looking at infrastructure, at um, uh, architecture, construction, uh, uh, all these, these areas. And the idea to actually print a bridge in the end came when we were invited by Autodesk to, to Pier 9 in San Francisco. And the evening before we had a meeting uh, with those guys, we, over a few beers, we were, we, we were thinking about something that would really blow their minds, a really cool project. And we are from Amsterdam. Amsterdam is known for all the bridges and the canals. So we already quite soon knew that it had to be a bridge, a stainless steel, a steel bridge. And um, 
So those guys were really enthusiastic, as were we, and they said, give us a call when you are uh, a little bit further in the process. So the next thing I did was um, I started making this animation, because you need an ID, you need a method of doing it. And, the, and our dream was to have a few robots that working their way towards each other and meet, in the end, meet in the middle. So I did, it's a hand-drawn hand animation. I spent quite some evenings uh, making this. So I brought it back to the studio, and um, my colleague came up with this photo. <laughs> Uh, the, it's the Sydney Harbour Bridge from 1933. And what I think was, what's cool about this image is that, that it, it really, it's very similar. I, I, haven't seen this be, I hadn't seen this before, so I didn't know it existed, but it looks exactly the same. And in a way, the image on the right is also prototyping, right? But it's, it's, it's very low tech, it's very analog, and the one on the left is more digital way of uh, 3D printing. So that's what you need. You need an ID. You also need money. <laughs> Um, and a lot of it for a project like this. So you need sponsors, you need to, uh, and, and not, not just, I'm not showing this because I have to, <laughs> but I'm showing this to, sh to, to make clear that a project like this, it's really complex to do, and it's not just about the money, it's also about the knowledge. Uh, people like Autodesk helped us in the design uh, process, uh, people from Lenovo helped us with, with the hardware we needed to, uh, to, to calculate and to, uh, to, for a generative design. We, we have partners in the steel industry, etc. cetera, and, and, and without those partners, we could never pull this off. You also need a location to place the bridge. This is actually the opening of our um, lab about two years ago. We had the deputy mayor of Amsterdam uh, press a red button, and we thought since we have robots, we might as well use them to, uh, to reveal where the bridge was going to be placed. And the location where it's going to be placed is, is in the center of uh, Amsterdam, in the red light district, which is a really cool place. It's uh, very frequently visited. I think there's about three, three to five million visitors every year, so it's a very visible space. And not inconveniently, it's about the most narrow canal in Amsterdam, so uh, we can start small. The only downside is that it's very, 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 very busy. So we already had to kind of step away from the idea of printing the bridge on site because you would need 24-7 security. You, you would need um, uh, shielding from weather and it would be too expensive and too complex to do. So we started practicing a little bit with printing larger objects. Uh, on the left, it's a bicycle that was done by students of uh, TU in Delft. And on the right, it's actually a bronze a sculpture we printed. The cool thing about this technique is every metal that you can weld, you could also 3D print, so you're really free in the amount of uh, materials that you use. <clears throat> Another piece is uh, this. This is also a screen, an, an art work made out of stainless steel. Uh, it, it's the biggest object so far that we've uh, printed in one piece. It's 450 kilograms, which is about 1,000 pounds almost, 900 pounds. And it's about 2.5 meters high. And right now it's uh, on exhibit in the Cooper Hewitt Museum in New York. And this is a, another project that we did. It's a cocoon-shaped bar that we printed for um, a museum in Miami. So we kind of, you know, we're printing bigger and uh, uh, bigger objects. So you also need a design. As said, uh, Autodesk helped us with the design process. We started thinking about topology optimization. So the people from Dreamcatcher, they helped us, uh, made a lot of iterations of what the design could look like. And uh, this was one of the first results of the bridge. We actually wanted to make it like this. The only problem with this design was that it was really hard to validate the structural integrity of this bridge because it's, uh, it's all but traditional. So we had to step away from this idea as well. And um, um, so we had many, many, many iterations, many ideas. And at a certain point we decided, because there was a lot unknown about the material, we decided to take a step back and um, go more for this ID. These are stress lines, compression strength, and uh, tensile strength, and we translated those in uh, this design in the end, um, this design. So this is the final design of the bridge. Also make sure after the presentations, uh, after this session, st stop by the Lenovo booth because there's a, a VR experience there where you can actually walk over the bridge and see it in real life. You can uh, write your name on it, etc. So that's, if you haven't already, please go. So the last thing you need is a permit to place a bridge. So another parallel with uh, Nikolai, the guy from Big House, is that he started without a permission, without a permit. He just started. He went doing it. 
There's always, you know, there's always a thousand reasons not to do something, but there's always, you always have to find for the one reason to do it, and you have to, the most important thing is you have to start. If you wait for a permit, especially for a bridge like this, you can wait forever. It's never going to happen. So we thought we, we, we're just going to start printing and, and we'll figure out how to get a permit for it later. And right now we're, um, uh, we started a project also together with uh, Autodesk and with the Alan Turing Institute. We're going to sensor up the whole bridge after it's done, after it's printed, and then we place it in our own warehouse and uh, we're going to put some full load, do some full load tests on it, so put the load on it that, uh, that, that is, is, is required. And then um, we're going to monitor the, the strength of it, the, the, how it's behaving. So there's going to be accelerometers on it, strain gauges, but we're also, when it's in place, we're going to continue monitoring it throughout its lifetime. And we can also gather some really valuable information about how a city works, you know, what kind of people are frequenting the red light district, information like that. So, um, and, and I'm really excited about this project. This is going to happen uh, quite soon. It's already, it's actually already happening because in Pier 9 in San Francisco, uh, Autodesk already censored up their footbridge uh, in Pier 9 to test what kind of sensors they're going to use and to prepare for the final placement in, uh, uh, on our bridge. So this is a really exciting project, actually, and uh, I think you're going to hear more about it uh, soon.